Hello and welcome to episode 306 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark. Now joining me on today's episode is the beautiful actress Ellen Adair. You'll know her from her roles in the TV series The Sinner, Homeland, maybe you've seen Bull, Trick, in Max We Trust, but on today's episode we mainly focus on her latest role in the film and the brilliant horror Heard. It's a great interview and one of those ones that you knew from the moment we started talking that it would have great chemistry. We've kept in touch since and I really hope we can do a follow up very soon. And before I hit play and give you that interview, let's quickly touch base and talk about our last episode. On episode 305, I was joined by the film director, Stephen Kayak. The interview focused on his brand new documentary, Rock Hudson, All That Heaven Allowed. I saw a great response to this, a whole new audience. It was amazing to see so many new listeners and a big thank you as well to Stephen for taking the time to share it as well on his social media. I really appreciate it. But today it's all about Ellen Adair. She is fantastic. And as you're listening to this right now, it is also on my brand new YouTube channel, Mark and Me TV. All you have to do is go onto literally YouTube and type in Mark and Me Podcast and there's five interviews now for you guys to enjoy. It's not even been a month since the channel's up, but it's doing really well and I really appreciate if you hit that subscribe button, some thumbs up and watch some of those interviews because people are absolutely loving them. So I think the only thing that's left to do now is to share this interview with you all. So here's me and Ellen talking all things acting. So Ellen, thank you for joining me today on the Mark and Me podcast. I am honored. Thank you so much for having me. What I love to do with every guest that comes on, and we've now gone over 300 episodes, but what I love to do is find out basically by taking you right to, right back to the very start. So when you first were a kid, were there certain TVs, uh, shows or films that you absolutely loved that made you want to get into the world of acting? I love this question. It's funny for me because I actually grew up without a television and both of my parents are college professors. They're academics. Yeah. And so that was why they, the, they were staunchly anti-television and Nevertheless, I, you know, I was allowed to watch TV at friends' houses. I was allowed to watch movies and so on. And we did go out to see movies as a family. But because of that, I was very sensitive to things that I saw. So a lot of the early movies that I saw completely terrified me. Because <laughs> I think I just wasn't, wasn't as used to seeing it in my own house every single day. However, I think that probably my first favorite movie that I saw was, and this just shows you how I've been a weirdo my whole <laughs> life. I'm excited now. Was Kenneth Branagh's Henry V. Wow, I, I was wasn't like, expecting that. Yeah, probably not a lot of people's answer. I was like five or six. Um, yeah. yeah, I was pretty young, but my parents, being college professors, took me to see Kenneth Branagh's Henry V, and I loved it so much i i just i made them take me back five times i loved it i could not get enough five i was just immediately times. like yes i was immediately like this this is my stuff and you know i think they had taken me to see live productions of shakespeare previously i remember having already seen a production of 12th night by that time so obviously at some point they were like we think our child can enjoy shakespeare but they were right and uh so yeah when they took me to see that movie they had some sense that i it though being i think five or six years old was going to enjoy shakespeare but i think i just i i loved everything about it and what's sort of funny for me reflecting on it is when i think about how completely terrified i was by other movies that I saw at that time that like were more meant for children, like completely terrified by The Little Mermaid. Horrified, had to leave wow. the theater. Um, completely terrified by Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And That was one of my first films I saw at the cinema. I couldn't believe the mix of um, animation with actual full motion. It blew my mind. Yeah, no, I mean, it's very cool, but also like the dip was very scary to me. And those eyes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, very scary. And 
oh oh i saw the prince's bride and was also very terrified by the scene where they like suck all the life out of him but henry v i was like this is fine yep. i'm into this yeah i don't know i yeah i i don't know what it is i just um i loved it i loved it so much i think i just immediately though i was young i just really loved the language you know um i just i only literally last week went to uh, in stratford over here in the uk stratford upon avon there's the rsc and i went to mm -hmm. see macbeth and mm. um it blew my mind and i'm going to the globe in two weeks to watch it in london so i can't wait Oh, wonderful. Is it this you're seeing also the Scottish play in yes. London or is it? A, OK, great. So you can do a compare and contrast. Yeah, I can't wait. Personally, I have preferred the things that I have seen at the Globe to the things that I have seen at the RSC. But obviously, they're both really excellent. Yeah, they're just amazing. And um, I haven't been a massive fan all my life, as in not that I didn't like it, as in I've only just started getting into it. But I was probably just being a bit of a snob and being like, oh, I don't want to go to the theatre. It's not for me. I'd rather go to a gig or I'd rather go to the cinema. And I went in and I was like, oh, my God, this is magical. And then I was just like, I didn't take my eyes off the cast for like two and a half hours. And I was like, this is the best thing ever. So now I'm like, I want to go to all the shows. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah, it is. It's a good time. And uh, it's not too far away. It's like an hour and a half to get to uh, the RSC. And it is beautiful because when you're walking around as well, obviously, all the grounds and the surrounding areas all for Shakespeare. So it's just like you feel like as soon as you get there, you're going to like be part of something special that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stratford is really wonderful. And I think one of the things that's so great about Shakespeare as theater specifically is that there's this really relationship between the actors and the audience because yeah. the actors are talking directly to the audience and so though obviously i love kenneth Branagh as henry v i feel like it is a the plays are really meant to be in when we're all in a room together when yeah. when it's sort of we're in relation to the space together as a community watching the thing so it's amazing because like there's moments in the show i swear i was like i'm sure Macbeth is looking at me in the eye like there's moments they just felt that connection or where they would shout and point and i was like god i really feel like immersed in this it's it's there's nothing else like it is there because it's live it's in front of you and it's it, it just it's magical that's the word yeah i studied for a couple of summers at shakespeare and company in western massachusetts and I remember this very, I mean, for me, life changing performance by this actor named Dan McCleary, who was playing Macbeth. And so, you know, I was I was 18 or 19 years old and had done a decent amount of, um, you know, Shakespeare for young people up until that point in my life. But there was something so incredibly conversational about the way that he used Shakespeare's text that made me realize, oh, this is why it's a tragedy. Like it's a tragedy if Macbeth is just talking to you and seems like your next door neighbor and you feel like you recognize yourself in him and you feel like you actually have a relationship with him and then you see this, you know, sort of terrible downfall and spiral into madness. You see yourself sort of lose the person that you felt like you knew and I remember because I, you know, I watched that studying there, I, I went to that performance a number of times and he was so conversational that there was this brilliant moment when and Macbeth has this line after one of the later witches scenes uh, that's just where did they go? And he was so conversational and he directed it so much towards the audience that a little kid in the audience <laughs> just thought like the actor lost the other actors and the little kid called out like they went that way. And I was <laughs> like, amazing. yes, that's what I want. Like that's what theater is supposed to be. Yeah, it was incredible. That's awesome. So after obviously starting at such a young age, seeing these incredible productions, seeing these stage performances and some great films that scared the hell out of you, um, <laughs> Was it kind of your vision and your parents, were they supportive in the way that you wanted to go down the career of getting into the film industry and acting? Or were they like, look, we really need you to get a real job and then you can do the acting as well, but let's try and get a backup. Or were they fully kind of in support and believed in you? I mean, I think that they were in sort of slightly in between those two poles, I guess, I think supportive, certainly, you know, so just to clarify, my father is a professor of folklore, and my mother is an art historian. So both of them study art. And so both of them 
feel very strongly the value of art to society and you know to to humanity and I think that also growing up with two parents who were studying artists, though visual artists generally, I think it gave me a false impression of like how important art was just to people generally. I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, artists are the most important people. Um, but I think that because they're both academics, they were, they're just, I think, aware of how hard life is as an actor. Yeah. And, um, and I think a little nervous about my life uh sort of setting off as an actor and so though i think they they are very supportive when i was looking at going to university they were like we do not want you to go to a theater program um we require of you that if we are going to help pay for your education that it is going to be something else so i have an english major very useful um and actually i'm incredibly grateful for it uh partly because I feel, uh, at least for myself, that being a writer is as important to my life as being an actor. And I think without without having been an English major, without having um, had professors that really inspired me to love literature as much as I have always loved being an actor and the theater and film and TV, uh, I'm not sure that I would be in that place. And I am grateful that I am in that place. So I am I never had any plans to be anything other than an actor with an English major. <laughs> um, but I'm actually very grateful at this point in my life that my parents had that requirement of me. Was there a moment in your career, uh, and I know obviously you've still got many years ahead, but was there a moment that it felt like a turning point? So there's a number of roles you've done within the TV and film industry, but was there a moment that it felt like you kind of made it and it felt like, okay, I can see a lot more uh, opportunities coming my way, my agent's busier, uh, I'm getting a lot more calls. It just felt like, okay, this is serious now. I really do feel like I'm going to be doing this for the for the long run. Mm. That's a wonderful question, <laughs> because I think uh, in some ways I'm like, I'm still waiting for that turning point. Um, but no, I think that that would be very um, unfair and ungrateful for the wonderful career that I've I've been lucky to have so far to say that. <sighs> you know, I mean, I think I having done so much theater, I did struggle to get into television and film uh, a little bit in New York, even though so I, I lived in Boston. I went to school in Boston and I, um, I stayed there for a few years working as an actor, which was a wonderful choice that I made because it's a very warm community there. And like, it was a wonderful way to kind of start out my career. So, I mean, right out of school, I had actually booked a, a couple of uh, TV things in Boston. And so despite growing up without a television. And I think, you know, at that point in my career, I was like, I just, you know, want to do Shakespeare and I want to do plays and so on. I found that I really loved it. I really loved the scale of it and um, the immediacy of it and the sort of like improvisatory, uh, maybe that's the wrong word, the the spontaneity that is so yeah. important in um, in TV and film. I really liked that. And so I then thought, you know, I love theater but I would really like to do more of this. And I, I moved to New York and was still doing a bunch of theater and had a kind of a hard time breaking in in that regard. Um, but I, because, because certainly something that is uh, perhaps true of humans in general, but certainly true in my experience of a career as an actor is that once you do something, people are like, that's what you are, right? So if you've done so a bunch true. of theater, people are like, you're a theater actor. There's no way that you could like do anything else, um, really, until you are a very famous person, and then they are interested in your transformation. Um, but that is, of course, very much the case about like the kinds of roles that you get offered. People will see you do one thing, and they're like, "Oh, well, but that's who you are. So we'll just have you do that thing for the rest of your so life, every single day." <laughs> that's it. Exactly. Yes. Um, so, in in an attempt to answer your question, I think that. I had gotten a few television roles, but uh, sort of my, I guess, like breakthrough television role potentially was this mini series called The Slap. Um, and it wasn't even a breakthrough so much in terms of, because it, it was not, um, it wasn't like a hit show that everybody saw and then everybody knew me from that show so much as um, that was the first show I, you know, I had a, 
um, a large recurring character on that show. And I actually felt like I was part of the show. Um, I actually felt like, you know, all of the other actors on that show, incredible actors, um, were very warm and welcoming to me and just treated me like one of their peers. And so I think that that made me feel like I was one of their peers instead of, you know, if you're doing just a day on a television show um, or you're just a guest star on sort of like one episode. Yeah. Very often you just sort of don't integrate into the company of the actors and that's fine. It's not, it's, it's just, that's kind of the nature of the job, right? Is that you're just sort of there and you do your job and then, and then you go home um, because you know, you don't, you're not there Try. for long when are you it's, it's literally you have a purpose and a job to do you tick that box and you go where if you're on four or five episodes or something you're going to be around the same people morning day and night for a few days so you can start having conversations and then invest in your time you know yeah but i will also say everybody on that show was incredibly welcoming of me from my first episode you know i think i've been on some other shows where sort of like the first episode oh but then people see that i've come back for like the second or third episode and we start talking more but they were just um you know the they were just they were very they were very kind and they made me feel very welcome and that was uh you know i don't want to um speak ill of any of the other previous experiences that I've had, because I think when you're a day player, I have a very much like do not speak unless spoken to kind of an attitude, you know, like if I'm there with very famous actors, I'm not going to like try to be friends with them. They're here to, yeah. you know, they, hey, they've buddy, got... how's it going? Do you want a Coke? Like, no, just leave me alone. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and like, honestly, from my very first television experience, um, which was on a show called Brotherhood, I there were actors who were incredibly kind to me. So, um, so I think in some ways, perhaps getting that my sort of first large television episode, um, that was that episode of Brotherhood, I think also really changed my life in terms of, you know, I was right out of school, and all I had was an English major, and I didn't have this sense of like, am I actually going to be able to do this? Or am I just going to try this for a few years and never get a job and then like figure out something else to do with my life? Um, but yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll sort of like point out those two things. Um, and, you know, I remain very grateful to John Robin Bates, who was the uh, writer of that series, The Slap, for casting me in that, but it was only, in that um, show. It was only a couple of years later after The Slap that you did The Sinner. And... Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of TV. I've spent obviously most of my life watching really good shows, but I invested so much time in the center because it kind of just gripped me straight away. Um, I thought it was one of the best first opening episodes of any TV. And it was just so consistent each week it delivered. I try and binge watch, but then I also think at the same time, I don't want it to be all over too quickly. So I kind of like not more, more episodes tonight. I'll wait. And with the center, um, it was always left me like, I need to push the play button and watch one more now because it's that good. But you must have been blown away to be involved in such an iconic TV show that people still talk about now. You know, it is one of the best TV shows, I think, in the last 10 years. I really was. Oh, my goodness. It was it was incredible. Um, I the first season of that show is so stunning. I feel like Jessica Biel gives one of my favorite television performances that I've ever seen. Yeah, it's mind-blowing. I just think she's, it, she is mind-blowing. She's incredible. And Bill Pullman is so wonderful in every single season of the show. It's just, I always feel like watching him listen is like drinking a glass of water. It's just so satisfying. So yeah, I think, I think it was the first season of that show was so gripping. Again, incredibly addictive to watch yeah and uh and so i felt incredibly lucky to get to be a part of the second season um which i think was also just like a really wonderful story and you know to get to work with actors like carrie coon and and hannah gross it was it was really a wonderful wonderful experience and i think you know that was also that was sort of a, a moment in my life where i also had this sense of like is my career kind of going up to the next level because I had just had uh, prior to that a really wonderful uh, recurring character on Homeland, yeah. which I also had a wonderful the same experience year. How with. How good is that? Twenty eighteen was year. the year. 
Yeah, yeah, it was it was great. And I was definitely like, yay, like my career is on the up and up. But you know, uh, there's this I'm a big baseball person. And there's this, uh, there's this saying prospect growth isn't linear when you're talking about a, a baseball player. And I always like say that to myself about an artistic career as well, like prospect growth isn't linear. <laughs> That's fair. So yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it, you know, in some ways, the pandemic um, has really disrupted a lot of things, uh, just in terms of the way that the industry works. And, yeah. um, and that's, you know, that's fine. Um, but yeah, that was a really incredible year to get to play really two different characters as much as I was whinging earlier about, you know, just being one thing, and then people just thinking that that's the one thing you can do. Uh, it was really but it's fun awesome, to- because like, that was two of the most talked about TV shows, like, you know, there's stuff like Lost and Heroes and all these great shows we talk about, like Breaking Bad. But in 2018, those two shows were everywhere. Everywhere I looked, they're advertised. And I was like, that must be pretty awesome to look at your CV and your IMDb and be like, yeah, that that was the year. It was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was uh, it was one of the most fun years of my life, for sure. That's awesome. And at the moment, obviously, you're promoting Herd. Now, um, how did this role actually come about for you? I just got an appointment for it um, yep. from my agents to audition for it. Um, and, uh, when I read the script, I was just immediately so in love with it. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I responded to very strongly was that I felt like it had, I, I read it in early 2021. Yeah. I felt like it had clearly been written in 2020, even though it is not about 2020, uh, which I feel like is exactly the kind of thing that we need right now to, to process this kind of societal trauma that we all went through, but nobody wants to talk about. And like, I don't want to see a movie about COVID. Nobody wants to see a movie about COVID. Um, but in terms of sort of what uh, what the pandemic did to our society and kind of like what that says about humanity, I think that that's what this film is looking at. And um, yeah, I just thought it was incredible. And then the other thing was that I just responded very strongly to the character of Jamie Miller. And I just felt like I immediately knew who she was and where she kind of resided inside of me. And I, I, I had very clearly this thought that I've, I've repeated a few times, but I thought I would die to do this movie as long as I can do the movie first and then die afterwards. <laughs> so. so when you met with um, Stephen Pierce, the director, and obviously you're talking about a zombie outbreak film, are you a fan of horror and the kind of uh, zombie kind of genre? Or were you then like, I'm going to go and do some studying and I'm going to go and watch stuff like Dawn of the Dead and all these classic horrors, or were they already familiar and in your world? You know, again, I'm going to say sort of somewhere in the middle. So I think because I grew up without a television, I grew up, <laughs> I talked about how terrified I was by like children's movies. Things that are scary in movies continued to be scary for me. And so for a number of years, I kind of joked like, well, I should really still do horror movies because the things that are scary are like more potent to me. Um, I am very scared by horror movies. But I have done a number, I've done four horror movies at this point, and I have become more of a student of the genre. And while I will say that every single kind of horror movie is not for me, uh, I do really like horror movies at this point, um, particularly if they are thoughtful, if they are movies that have something to say about the human condition. And so, I, you know, one of the things that I think is really, um, for me, a virtue of the of the zombie world of herd is that they are virus based zombies, yeah. uh, rather than being undead zombies. And so that makes it a little bit more plausible. And the films that I, um, or the television shows that I like most in the zombie world are, um, are are the ones like the 28 days later films oh, what um, a classic oh my gosh which are so good both like both of them are so good um and i had actually already seen um one of them and uh i rewatched both of them before shooting this film and unfortunately this has come out after we shot this movie but the television series the last of us i think is incredible 
And um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of that show because I think, again, it is very much about like, what is this circumstance doing to what it means to be a human? And uh, yeah, and I think that's very much the case for Herd as well. So are there other horrors that you've discovered because now the genre's in your life, you've done four horrors that you talked then about not all horrors for you, but are there some classics that you've just absolutely fallen in love with? Because I could talk horror all day long. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, I am, a. I mean, I don't know if this is a classic or not, but I am a big fan of The Babadook. Yes, um, the, kid's yeah. no, the kid's voice was annoying. I don't know why he really grated on me. And I was like, you'll scream. And I know he's meant to be, and he's meant to be this evil kid that's like being possessed. But the way he was like, mommy, mommy. And I was like, oh, like it's really winding me up that it took me away from the film. I know that's bad, but I just got wound up with him. Yeah, no, I mean, I feel like, Horror movies exist to wind you up. Um, yeah, it however, did, it, it that did might its be. Job, but yeah, yeah. You know. yeah, I didn't have that same response, but I think that that's a, that's a it's an understandable response to have. Yeah, I I just I sort of feel like that that the the monster as a metaphor for grief is yeah. um, makes the film really really interesting, um, and I'm I'm trying to think. You know, when I so the first horror movie that I shot. Um, was called Trick, and I had asked the director to give me a sort of a watching assignment list, and I saw um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Yeah, that's like a nine, like in the seventies, wasn't it? it might be yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It's but like some some uh, some things from that film have really stuck with me. I'm just, I was trying to think about things that are super classic. I think my favorite thing that um, he had me watch for that, just not vis-a-vis -vis the film that then we were going to shoot, but just the thing that I liked the most was um, the movie Zodiac, which I thought was just incredible, yeah. which I feel like some people might sort of qualify as horror and some people might not. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, Sorry to not have like a, a sort of fuller answer for you. You don't need to. I mean, you. Zodiac's yeah. an absolute masterpiece and um, some of the best writing and directing I've ever seen. And when you've got David Fincher, he is just an absolute genius. Like, I think he's one of the best in the whole world. I wouldn't disagree with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, he's, he's absolutely incredible. Yeah. So now that Herd's out there and people can go and see this, um, what's your kind of vision for the next kind of six months to 12 months? Because obviously with the writer strikes and everything slowing down, do you feel like getting back into writing more or are you still wanting to do as much acting work as you can? Or have you ever thought of going on the other side of the camera and directing? Is that a vision you see yourself maybe doing one day in life? Yeah, that's a um, another really excellent question. Yes, obviously things have been slower for a while with the writer strike, and I also think with the studios being aware that we were sort of probably going to head into a couple of strikes. Production was down really in the last year before the strike. Um, so obviously, like I would, uh, I I love acting very much. It brings me so much joy, and so uh, I would love to get the chance to hop back in, having been on this kind of like strike-related hiatus. Um, but also I have been writing more, um, you know, it's, it's always been a part of my life, but honestly in the shutdown part of the pandemic, um, was when I was basically able to make it, um, more a central part of my life. Yeah. Um, prior to that, I had always had this goal of, I want to try to write at least a little bit five days every week. But that was always so hard to make that happen. Um, and we're sort of heading back into a world in which that is harder to make it happen. However, I feel like now what I have behind me is um, is having spent so many days uh, in which that has been my main focus is writing. So, uh, you know, certainly I have been um, I've been writing a lot more during the strike and um, working on a number of projects. Uh, I have a com completed draft of a novel and um, a couple a completed draft of a couple of the first two in a, in a trilogy series um, and also a completed screenplay draft 
um, oh, I'm working on a television sleep? series. That's a lot of writing. <laughs> it's a lot of writing. Yeah, yeah, I really, I really love it. Um, so I do, I do sleep. I mean, I've, you know, I've, some of these projects I've been working on, you know, since yes. like 2019. So um, that's with the sort of trilogy uh, I've been working on that project. So um, in answer to your question, I have directed some for theater. And I would love to direct for um, for the camera as well. I do have a sense of um, that I know there would be a learning curve there. There are certainly things that I do know from the number of television shows and movies that I've been in in terms of um, you know, in terms of the things that way the way that things cut together and in terms of the way that shots are lined up and so on, but that I know I'd need to have like a really good DP who is okay with yeah. me not knowing a lot about that side of things. Um, I do feel like obviously the the talking to actors part would be the easiest part for me. Um, but that there's there's so much more that is involved in being the director of something that is for the camera um, in some ways than directing something for theater, there are other elements, um, you know, that you need to talk to your design team about or design yourself or whatever it is, but like most of your job is talking to actors. So that is certainly something that I would love, but I think something that I am um, more actively working towards is being the writer that is on that side of the camera um, than the director. And are there, obviously, when everyone gets into a business that they want to work within, are there certain directors or other actors that you just dream to work with? And I know everyone would love to work with all the big names, but are there certain people that you're such a fan of their work, it would feel like a a milestone for you to tick that off on a list and say, yes, I finally got to work with that person. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> There might be a hundred names you've got in your head. There, but... are, there are like a hundred names. Um, yeah. Uh, well, my favorite actor in the world is Mark Rylance. Um, Just an I absolute genius. I think he's, I think he's so, so incredible. Um, talking about life-changing performances. Um, when I was at Oxford, I saw him at the Globe um, playing Olivia in Twelfth Night and like just again completely changed my life um, and I I think that um, his charisma is so interesting and and his presence is so completely magnetic uh, and I think it is comes from this fact that he is just so astonishingly present and actually doesn't like put anything else on top of that it's it's incredible so um so he's the first person that springs to mind um when when herd was premiering in london um we actually went to go see him in dr semmelweis because that was i was just like look if i can see mark rylance in anything then that is that is always my choice was that um, during um fright fest just a couple of weeks ago yes i was yes. there but i couldn't get to see many of the screenings because i was just at different events during the whole time but it was just such an amazing event like so many horror fans everyone just celebrating together there didn't seem to be a boundary between the stars and the the fans and it just felt like a really nice big family celebrating horror it was amazing it was incredible. Yes, yeah. yes. Major respect to um, to the people who hold that event because, yeah, I found it to be um, far more of just like a big, warm, happy family than yeah, other it really film was festivals lovely. that I'm I've like, been I can't to. wait to go back next year. I'm like, this is great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you got Mark yeah. Rylance. That's a hell of a name to go for. And then is there anyone else? <sighs> I mean. I, I feel like there's, of course, there's a million other people, um, but I'm having a hard time sifting through all of the names <laughs> clamoring at me to like pick one particular, um, one particular person. Yeah. That kind of stands above the rest. Yeah. You know. I can hear your brain going. Dit, 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 dit. Yes. Um, oh. <laughs> I'm just, sometimes I just get in this place where I just can't think of the name of a person. I do it all the time. I don't know time. if you'll be it's kind enough to like edit this out. I'm like, I'll edit flushing. it, I'll make it look perfect. Yeah. So you just go, 
Oh, so and so. Yeah, um, but no, I just I do this, and I've done it my entire life. If we're if I know that we're editing all this out, where I'm like, oh, you know, like the guy who did the movie that's called, and like then I just can't think of any of the names. Yeah, my um, brain does it all the time, and the worst part is it's usually when I meet someone, they're like, oh, this is the director, so and so, and I'm like, brilliant, and then the two minutes later, they're like, so Mark, blah blah blah, and I can't even use their name because instantly I'm like, oh, I forgot your name, and now I can't remember, and I'm on the spot, and then someone else will walk over and be like, oh hi mark and then you're like oh this is uh <laughs> you're like i forgot their name yes yes <laughs> so bad um anyway it's uh it's quite ridiculous when i'm talking about a famous person and i like i know exactly who they are it's not that i've forgotten who they are it's just that i can't think of their name when put on the spot um so i would you know i mean again there's a there's a million million people that i'm going to pick but out of out of everybody um, I would love to work with Martin McDonough. Wow. Yes. Yes. I, I, um, I really love all of his plays and his movies and, um, and I love the way in which the, the human condition then gets sort of blown up right like i i kind of like the the extremity of um i mean you know i'm thinking specifically of what was his last film i'll google it now it's on the tip of my tongue and it's annoying me they're all the other but the problem is all of his other plays are yeah i'm sorry i've made this an editorial nightmare Don't i worry. also have a podcast really so i know how it. terrible that is um just the names of all of his other plays are clamoring into my brain and um is it the banshees of the insurance yes 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 R read that one out because i can't pronounce that in insurance so if you say it i'll get it right yes um so his last film the banshees of inisherin I felt as I was watching the beginning of it, I was like, I feel uncomfortably seen. I feel like both sides of myself are represented in this friendship. <laughs> and what, what a film that was like. So incredible. So good. Just unbelievable. Astonishing. But then I, I, what I appreciate about the McDonough style is, is, um, is again, the, like the extremity of it and, and the way that it is extrapolated to this place where you're like, no, just, just stop. Um, that I kind of like when things take a sort of a McDonough turn. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, and I suddenly sort of... go where you could never ever predict. And then the moment exactly. he's starting to chop his own fingers off, I'm like, I didn't see this coming at the nice, beautiful landscape shots of parts of Ireland. And now he's throwing it at the door. I'm like, this was never going to be on the cards. But of course, with this director, it was on the cards the whole time. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just so, it's so interesting the way that like intense realism kind of butts That's against exactly it. Yeah. otherworldly violence in his work. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I think the part of me that is a huge fan of that kind of like, oh my God, it's so messed up, is the part of me that is a, is a, is a fan of a certain kind of horror as well, um, that that is very appealing to me. So yes, that will yeah, be- that, that will three be... billboards have been some of the best films I've seen recently. Just incredible. So incredible. In Bruges, like just so good. Like what, They're all what a amazing. CV, what an incredible career. Yeah, and I, I mean, every single one of his plays, I've never done one of his plays either. I would just love to do one of his plays. I'd love to like work with him as a writer. But you know, if I can, if, if I, I ever can get pick... him on the podcast, I'm going to say, listen back to this episode. Yes, if I can pick if I can pick one actor and one director, I guess those are those are the first go. ones that came to my head. Yes. What I do on this podcast, uh, and I do it on every episode, and it's my final question for you today, is every guest that gets to come on the podcast gets to choose the final song that's played. So after we've edited all this episode and the world gets to listen to us chat, as it finishes, every single guest gets to choose a piece of music or a song or a band that they love. And what's really good is I've never had any crossover, so someone always chooses something different. But is there a song or a piece of music that you just love that when I asked the question came to your heart and soul above any other one that you would love to be played out on today? <laughs> I 
<laughs> talk about I, putting you on the spot. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, I love this question. I love it so much. But yes, it's it's the world of songs that I love that are clamoring at me right now. Like, pick me. I am going to choose Move On Up by Curtis Mayfield. God, I love that song. Plus, it's really long. There's like a nine minute version. That's the nine the minute version yeah. is so great. I mean, you know, the like three we'll, minute we'll version. We'll put the nine minute awesome. one on because I think every artist should be able to choose the song how they listen to it. And that is the one. Yeah, it's so good. I love I love a song that like is in a minor key or has minor key elements, but is up tempo. Yeah. And I feel like the song has so much about like life is hard, but we make it better. Um, that uh, that I feel like I want to. I, I need that energy in my life almost every single day. And I want to bless everybody else with that energy as well. It's an awesome song. It should be the one that opens an episode like da, 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 da. instantly. You can't be like, da, 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 oh, well, this da, is going to be a terrible da, da, episode. Da, da, like da, da, you just instantly want to dance. Yes. You want to yes. sing along. And then there's like a three and a half minute sort of instrumental bit on that extended version that just goes off on one. There's loads of like hand drums and stuff going on and percussion. And I'm just like, this is awesome. Like, it's such a great tune. And his voice is just like, I could He's listen wonderful. to it all day. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of my all time favorite songs. And uh, uh, you're right to sort of talk about the instrumentation because all of the musicians that he's working with are just so incredible. That's a hell of a choice. And no one's picked it yet. Even after we've done 300 episodes, I've had quite a few people recently pick the Beach Boys for some reason. They must be hmm. doing something right because a lot of guests are choosing the Beach Boys, but not the same song. But finally curtis mayfield comes on the podcast oh, i'm so glad that uh, i was able to make that happen the beach boys are wonderful like they are yeah, but, but something different is always good and what will happen now is i'll go and edit the episode i'll listen to curtis mayfield i'll then leave spotify playing it'll play loads of curtis mayfield and i'll discover loads of songs i've not heard by him before and then probably spend the next two or three weeks just listening to him well you know you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> yeah i owe you but what I will yeah, say so is um, genuinely, I feel like I could talk for you for hours. And what I normally do on the podcast is I get a guest on, you know, kind of break the ice, get to know each other and then come back on and we can talk about other stuff. And I really believe that, you know, there's a door always open for you. And if you'd like to come back on at any point, we can just sit and talk about any different genre or any different music or just stuff in life. And I feel like we've just scraped the surface today and there's so much more we can discuss. Well, I mean, I, I, at least I came out of the gate saying that I talk too much. Um, I also feel like I could talk to you for a very long time. Um, and I really appreciate that. I would absolutely love to come back on. I think you are an excellent interviewer. That's very kind. Uh, I think you're like I just really leave it nice and relaxed and nice and chilled. And I don't try and get like a headline or try and wear my way in to try and ask a question that someone feels uncomfortable. I like it that it feels like I don't know. I've just met you and we're having a drink at a table, like a coffee, and we're just chatting. And if that works and it's nice and relaxed for you and for me and I've enjoyed it and you're enjoying it, then don't change it. Yeah, no, but I just I respect how good you are at this thing that you do as a person who also like, you know, does a couple podcasts like it's hard. It's harder than people think it is. It is. And, and I try and not um, change for anybody. So even though I've had Anthony Hopkins, who's one of the greatest actors yeah. in the world, I've had um, Kevin Smith as a director, who's one of my idols. I've never changed. I've always just been me. I've never kind of, you know, tried to be someone different and people like that. And that's why it's done so well. So, um, yeah, you are genuinely hands on heart more than welcome. And let's not leave it too long because I said this to some people and people like Neil Blomkamp, the film director, and Neil Marshall, they've been on four times now. So there's always something to talk about. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would really love that. I would really Amazing. love that. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. It honestly means the world to me for coming on. Um, I've loved all your work. I've loved the film as well. I've been sent an advanced screener, so I've been able to see it, and I thought it was just great, and I really feel like the director's got a great career ahead of him. Uh, it, I think and I'm so just, too. I'm really excited. I wish I'd seen it on the big screen at the Fright Fest, but you have to be in 100 places at once, so it's just unfortunate. Yeah, completely understandable. It was pretty great. I mean, to see it on the IMAX screen, it was pretty incredible for us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. So thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Yeah, I think you're very gifted. It's like, it's a date. Let's make it happen. I think you're awesome. Awesome. Have a great rest of the day and I will uh, connect with you very soon. Great. Yeah, we'll do it. I, You know what? I look forward to the next time I get to talk to you. So there it is. There's my interview with me and the absolutely incredible Eleanor Dare. 
We hit it off straight away. It's like I've known her all my life. What an amazing actress. What an amazing guest. What an amazing podcaster. She's just an all-round amazing person and I'm so lucky that she came on the Mark and Me podcast. And as you heard us discuss heavily on today's episode, the film Heard is out now. Go and stream it now. Go and check it out wherever you watch your films and let me know what you think. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, please share it. It takes nothing to do. And I say this on each and every episode because it's crucial to the growth of Mark and me. I'm a one man independent podcaster. I don't have a team of people working for me. So all I ask in return for listening to this episode and enjoying a free episode, usually a couple of times a week, just share it. Go on Facebook and hit the share button. Go on Twitter and hit the retweet button. And on Instagram, like it or put it as part of your stories. It really goes a long way. And as I said earlier, this interview is also available to watch on my YouTube channel. I'm putting a lot of time and effort into there and bringing you so many videos over the next few weeks. So please check it out and obviously hit that subscribe button. Also, I want to say a massive thank you to the sponsors of the podcast, Richard Sounds and the amazing Folio Society. If you're in the market for a brand new TV, home cinema, surround sound system or Sonos, why not go on richardsounds.com and hit them up for some incredible deals. And if you're in the market for a beautiful brand new book, there is no better company out there than the Folio Society. Go on foliosociety.com and choose some incredible, beautiful books. And honestly, it guarantees to make your life better. One last thing before I go, I do also have a Patreon account. This podcast can't run with just me putting them out there free every time. I do ask for a little bit of support and for as little as £1, if you sign up on Patreon, you will receive a welcome pack which has a badge, which has some stickers. You'll get some exclusive access to episodes that are only available to people on Patreon and a newsletter each and every month. And that money goes right back into the podcast and allows me to go out there and record more episodes for you guys at home. That's all that's left for today's episode and what I'm going to do now is go and edit some more because there's so much more coming to my YouTube channel and to my podcast channels over the next few days. So until then, look after yourself, take care, go and watch the film Heard and I'll speak to you all very soon. Just move on up toward your destination. Though you may find from time to time complication. Move on up, move on up, watch 
child, but just move on up. 